Thanks for welcoming P back to the stage. For those of you that enjoyed our uh, just rambunctious conversation around generative artificial intelligence. And it's great that we are fortunate to have uh, Tess and Manish here from the Office of Science Technology Policy and the National Science Foundation, respectively, to give a little more context on the National AI Research Resource, which we discussed a bit as a potential place for folks to come together and work on some of these issues that we're concerned about. So I'll briefly pass it to Manish to introduce himself a little bit more since y'all already heard about me. Good. Thank you, Austin. I appreciate the opportunity. My name is Manish Parashar. I'm the Office Director for the Office of Advanced Cyber Infrastructure at the National Science Foundation. Tess? Hi, Tess Tabalk Malls, a Senior Policy Advisor in the National AI Initiative Office at the Office of Science and Technology Policy. And, and I've been uh, had the privilege to serve as the co-chair of the National AI Research Resource Task Force alongside Manish uh, since the last year. Thank you. And so for a bit of brief background, the National AI Research Research Task Force was established in the 2020 National Defense Authorization Act. And it was a, it was a task force mandated by Congress, driven by um, our good friend, the retired Senator Rob Portman, as well as Senator Heinrich and Anna Eshoo in the House, um, and also the dearly departed Mr. Gonzalez as well. Um, but they did some great work around that legislation. We worked on it for a few years to figure out how we could get rid of some of these kind of um, preventative aspects that keep people from getting involved in artificial intelligence. And so, as many of you probably know, artificial intelligence research is often bounded by the amount of computing power that you have, the amount of data you have accessible, the training tools that are available to you, the curricula, the educational materials. And so, in the last 18 months, um, Tess and Manish in the, in the final stretch here especially, but I know you've both been very involved the entire time, have been, you know, working to take the kind of vague dreams of me and others in Congress that were working on this and bring them into a reality through what, if you watch the final session, was a, a very vigorous, ultimately collegial process because these issues, while incredibly nerdy, are hyper important, require a ton of scientific knowledge. And ultimately, it's a great potential asset for the United States of America, both for democratizing and strengthening our innovation ecosystem. So I think, you know, with that, I'll go straight over to Tess and say, dig a little bit more maybe into what we mean by a national AI research resource beyond my, my brief introduction. And then, you know, what, what does that mean and why do we need it? Yeah, thanks, Austin. I think you gave the perfect introduction. One thing I would add is that the, the task force that came together that Manish and I co-chaired was a federal advisory committee uh, and released uh, the final report at the end of January. So we're really excited to be able to talk about those recommendations that were put forward in the report as a detailed implementation plan for a national AI research resource, or NAIR as we call it. And so the vision for the NAIR is for a shared national cyber infrastructure that would be broadly accessible federated collection of resources needed to fuel AI. So from computational resources to public and private data sets, test beds, software, and then as well as the training tools and user uh, resources that would enable users to come in and use the resources that would be made available through the NAIR. And the task force, uh, as it was uh, mandated by Congress, um, developed a, an administration and governance plan as well as part of the implementation plan and recommended a cooperative stewardship model uh, for the NAIR, where NAIR operations would be funded out of the National Science Foundation, but those resources, the computational data set, test bed resources, would be funded by multiple federal agencies uh, and then federated together. And those agencies would serve as a steering committee, re really setting the strategic direction uh, of the NAIR. Um, ensuring that we're we're meeting uh, you know the very the many missions of federal agencies and serving their, the many communities that are served across the federal government, and the NAIR itself would be intended to serve AI researchers pursuing foundational AI research, uh, use-inspired AI research, as well as translational research, and really the strategic objective is to democratize the AI R&D environment. Importantly, in a way that um, upholds privacy, civil rights, and civil liberties. And we really see the NAIR as a vehicle to spur innovation, to increase diversity of the AI research environment, uh, to build the U.S. capacity, so to make sure that U.S. researchers really are um, equipped to push the boundaries of AI, and then um, importantly to also advance trustworthy AI. And so uh, Austin really previewed the reason that we think the NAIR is such an important investment. Um, and first being that you know AI is an engine of invention. Uh, it's driving scientific discovery, it's driving economic growth, um, but we feel we've really just scratched the surface of the, the ability to apply AI to solve big societal problems. 
And we see the NARE as a, uh, one way to help uh, support research in that direction. And then as, as Austin said, you know, there is a, um, the, the U.S. is continuing to advance rapidly in AI R&D, um, but oftentimes the access to that cutting edge is uh, limited to researchers who are in the private sector or in very well-resourced universities. Um, and so we feel that the ability to um, advance AI in a way that works for all Americans uh, and we're advancing trustworthy, we're managing the risks of AI, and we're also um, harnessing AI for the public good, really depends on bridging this access divide so more Americans can get involved in AI research. Yeah, that makes, makes a lot of sense. And I think, you know, based upon what we talked earlier, from the very large generative models that are kind of capturing imagination down to some of the unsexy applications that are ultimately going to drive economic development and be a place for that democratization and diversity, use-inspired translational research, all of that together. Manish, can you give us a sense of like what types of resources are going to be in the NAIR and how they'll be made available? Absolutely, Austin. Right. So as Tess mentioned, the NAIR is envisioned as this uh, widely accessible cyber infrastructure that brings together the full diversity of resources that are really essential to addressing the diverse needs of AI R&D and to bridge this digital divide, right, between the, the uh, uh, researchers that have access to resources and those who don't. And so there would be a federation of new and existing resources that would be operated by third-party resource providers and would be uh, funded through uh, multi-agency solicitations, and they'd be brought together and made accessible through an integrated portal where they can be used to discover these things. Uh, to discover the resources, and they would be governed by transparent, open policies and processes, right? Uh, now, in terms of compute resources, this would include high-performance computing, uh, more traditional servers and clusters, uh, cloud services, uh, resources at the edge, test beds, so a whole diversity of compute resources. Data would be included, and this would include uh, possibly funding, new data stores, as well as including existing data store by providing them resources. But an important aspect is both for the resources and for the data that they are vetted for privacy, civil rights, and civil liberties before they're integrated into the, into the NAIR. Uh, and the NAIR is also uh, recommended exploring a marketplace commons type of a model where users can contribute data sets. Uh, they would include software and training uh, for a diversity of users so that you have the right set of tools, right? So, at, at, so you can bring in users at different levels of prof proficiency, as well as having different ways to provide support, training, uh, including uh, consulting services or models where you have peer interaction so they can mentor and help each other, right? Researchers could help each other. Um, the user community would include uh, researchers, educators, students, uh, from institutions, from nonprofits, from federal labs, from FFRDCs, uh, from local and tribal agencies, and including startups and small businesses. Those are funded through the SBIR, Small B uh, Business Innovative Research, or the STTR, Small Business Technology Transfer Programs. Um, in terms of how they access the resources, there would be different ways to allocate resources. They could be uh, resources that are funded uh, through allocations given to different agencies as part of the research that they fund, but also uh, there'll be researchers that'll be allocated directly by the NAIR operating entity itself. And these would be based on the size. For example, if you're a researcher, you want a quick startup uh, allocation, right? This would be modest in size, but would be allocated very quickly, right? Within a couple of weeks. But then if you're doing very large, sizable research that needs a lot of resources, then you'd go to a more uh, uh, elaborate process which requires peer reviews. Um, and, uh, and just overarching, uh, I'd like to emphasize that everything in there, right, whether it's the research that's supported or the resources that come in, data or compute, they're all going to be uh, vetted to make sure that they are, they do not uh, violate privacy, civil rights, civil liberties. So, right, so that's sort of the overarching guardrails that are set around the NAIR. Right, so that gives you an idea of what we have. Uh, back to you, yeah. Austin. Yeah, and I think what is so exciting about that is that you do kind of respect the broad swath of federal agencies that must be involved, of the people that must be involved, in particular those who 
do you just want to spin up on one small thing who have never had the opportunity to do so? I talk to a lot of students and young researchers who have brilliant ideas and yet they cannot have 10 GPUs. They can't have one GPU, you know? So I find that super exciting. But Tess, I want to move to something that, you know, we talked about a little bit earlier today. Um, I think to what you're saying, you know, this research that's being oftentimes left on the cutting room floor is more focused on trustworthiness or social issues. Um, our U.S. R&D numbers are spectacularly high, but only counting the private sector, right? And the private sector, of course, has their their motivators to do these things as properly as possible. But, you know, how does the NAIR give us another avenue, perhaps primary avenue, to address some of these trustworthy AI problems? And, and what are its other factors at play? Yeah, thanks. So, I think there's a twofold the impact of the NAIR in this space is we really see an opportunity for the NAIR to set the standard for responsible AI research through the design and implementation of its governance process, as Manish previewed. We think that you know the NAIR, in order to earn and maintain the public trust, particularly around AI, it will need to transparently demonstrate um, how the research using the NAIR is reviewed, approved, and performed in a way that meets the expectations of the public. Uh, and so the task force recommended that the NAIR uh, develop publicly reviewable resource acceptance tri criteria and data set controls, as well as privacy, civil rights, and civil liberties uh, review criteria for any research that's conducted on the NAIR. And that governance and framework and policies would be uh, would draw from the expectations uh, that are detailed in the blueprint for an AI Bill of Rights uh, that OSTP issued last fall as well as the best practices um, in the AI uh, risk management framework uh, that uh, NIST uh, issued actually two days after uh, the task force's report. It was a big week for AI. Um, and then importantly, we see a, a really important role for the NAIR to support uh, research into trustworthy AI. So advancing AI auditing, testing and evaluation, bias mitigation, security, and really being able to move forward that thrust of research alongside the cutting edge. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And again, it's something that we did. We talked about at 2.30 today, for those of you that were in this room, we simply do not have the capacity or the place to do a lot of this work right now. And only such a public private kind of like common work, common good place can really get it done. So, I mean, again, very nerdy. Thank you for all that are here, but very exciting. Manish, now that we've got the report out, I think, substantive piece, very broadly, positively received. What's next? Well, the task force itself, as for the congressional mandate, uh, ends after 90 days from when we submitted the report in January. Um, once we have submitted the report, now it's up to the executive branch to work with Congress to find ways to move forward uh, and realizing the NAIR effort. Uh, the task force recommended a, a phased approach to establish the NAIR it really defined four phases. You start up with the program launch and setting up an operating entity. Uh, the operating entity then starts up. You have an initial operational phase, and then you do the full production operation of the NAIR. Um, however, realizing that this can take time, the, NAIR, the task force also suggested a pilot approach, right? Can we leverage resources that already exist as part of the broader national cyber infrastructure and make them accessible to the AI R&D community so that they can start it right away, right? So that does a couple of things. Uh, it uh, gives immediate access to resources, right? We did, talked about this digital divide. So researchers can get started, get the access to the resources, and we can truly democratize and broaden our AI uh, uh, research ecosystem. But it also gives experience. So as the, the uh, NAIR is being stood up, we have some experience about uh, technical uh, issues and other things as we start the pilot, right? Uh, and so that's the concept. The pilot concept is something we've been, we are intend to explore both in the interagency, but as well as non-government uh, entities to see how we can start out and move ahead uh, with this pilot approach. Yeah, and for those uh, who are interested in getting involved, I would recommend that you get in contact with the National Science Foundation or the OSDP to talk about this. Uh, there is a lot of work to be done to move as quickly as we can, not to continuously reiterate the panel we did earlier, but I think the urgency of it and the rapid, massive adoption and iteration of this technology gives us very serious impetus to move on it. But I'll say I'll end on kind of the same question I ended on last time, which is 
look six years into the future, right? We've succeeded on setting these things up. We've gotten the group together. It's kind of like this beautiful consortium of people driving AI research. What does it look like? I think um, one thing that I would like to see um, in six years is that we have already demonstrated that something like the NAIR will have enabled a really diverse set of uh, researchers to uh, pursue uh, AI-related research across a range of domains. And so that we were already tr starting to make an impact on building the diversity of the AI research community, while also showcasing the impact of AI on big societal problems like climate change and um, biomedical research. I echo you, Test, right? I think we really have to make measurable pro progress towards the overarching goal to democratize access, to have a diversity of researchers being able to contribute to foundational use inspired and translational AI research. It's so important that we can leverage the breadth of our research talent across this country towards this important area. Yeah, and I'll close by briefly saying from our perspective, I would love to see people, no matter where they are in the country or where they're from, feel the ability to participate and have agency in the creation of technology that is unquestionably going to underpin all of our lives in the near future. And second, on the next NIST RMF, AI RMF update, when they get to that testing and evaluation panel and they ask the unanswerable question of, can we validate large models or how do we know these work in context? They'll say, we do because of the NAIR. That is my dream. All right, I think that's what we have. We may have a time for a question or two, but I don't think so. No, we don't. I've been mad on the fact.